Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, Happy New Year to all of you meeting here at Central Campus and also those of you meeting together at one of our regional campuses in Airdrie, Bridgeland in the south, northwest Calgary in the Crowfoot area. Those of you who are part of the Edge Home Church Network and those of you, of course, who are watching online. We're into a new year again and I'm reminded of the fellow who was really fed up with the way that he was living his life and So he made this long list of New Year's resolutions that he was determined to keep this particular year. Well, on January 1st, things were going exceptionally well. He was really pleased with his progress, but he didn't want to get too overconfident. And so around noon, he um, thought it would be a, a good time to pray. He said, so far today, Lord, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped, haven't lost my temper haven't been greedy, haven't eaten more than I should. And I'm feeling really good about that. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to be getting out of bed. (laughs) From then on, I'm really going to need a lot more help. (laughs) Amen to that. Well, I trust that you had a restful, Christ-filled Christmas and uh, some good times with those who are near and dear to you. After our Christmas Eve services... Gwen, my wife, and I, we headed over to Foothills Hospital and spent the, the, uh, the night awaiting the arrival of our seventh grandchild, who arrived wonderfully on Christmas Day morning. And uh, <clears throat> since we consider you all our extended family, I want to introduce you to her. So uh, here she is, uh, Cadence Emery Shore. And uh, she's daughter of Jonathan and Kristen Shore. What a special Christmas gift from our Heavenly Father. On behalf of our family and our staff here at Center Street Church, we just want to wish you God's very best uh, for this coming year. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we read this. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So let me ask you if your child or your neighbor, perhaps a working associate or a fellow student in the class that you're in, were to ask you to explain what you believe and why, do you feel that you'd be prepared to give a reasonable answer or at least point them to a credible answer? As I interact with people, it seems that people today are far more open to talking about matters of faith than they were even 10 years ago. In fact, my sense is many people are tired of just having opinions. Everywhere you go, people have opinions. Well, I I believe God exists, yes, or no, I don't believe he exists. Lots of opinions. But what I'm discovering is that more and more people want to go deeper and come to terms, move beyond opinions and get down to what it is they really believe and why they believe it. And so I want to challenge you with two things. First of all, if you're a Christ follower, that you would take in this entire series so that in the words of Colossians 2, 7, you would be rooted in Christ, that you would be strengthened in your faith. And be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. If you're a seeker, I want to ask that you would be open-minded enough to also take in this entire series and listen to the entire sermon. Don't walk out if you disagree with something. And that you would sincerely pursue the truth. That you would examine the evidence and have the courage to embrace where the truth leads you. And then secondly, that you would invite those in your sphere of influence who may be skeptical about the Christian faith but are open-minded enough to examine and to discuss the evidence with you. For your information, this coming Monday morning, 
In fact, every Monday morning, you can go online on our website and you can access the previous weekend sermon. You can access the sermon study guide. In fact, you can access a synopsis of the sermon. And you can use that for your own personal study. You can use it to discuss these subjects with someone, perhaps one-on-one, or with your family, or perhaps with your small group of friends. Your invitation to someone to be part of this series may not only transform your life, but could be the key that God uses to change the trajectory of someone's life and someone's eternity. And I pray that it may be so. So I'm going to invite you to stand, if you would, as we dedicate this time and this series to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for revealing yourself to us. We look at the universe. We look at your creation. We look at the miraculous birth of a child. And we see you in it all. We see your majesty. We see your creative power. We also sense your love for us. Thank you for revealing yourself through the written word, the scriptures. Thank you also for revealing yourself through the living word, through Jesus Christ, who came in part to show us what you're really like and how much you love us and want to be in relationship with us. Lord, as we engage these tough questions over the next number of months, I ask, Lord, that you would guide and to help me, first of all, to communicate your heart, to communicate what is true in a sensitive and loving way. I pray that you would soften hearts, that we would be open-minded enough to really examine the evidence and then have the courage to respond the way that you'd have us to. For I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Watch this. Can you tell me, do you believe in God? No, I don't. No. No? No. Um, that's a good question. I don't know if I know the answer to that. Yes. I do believe in God. Yes, we're good friends. Is that right? Yeah. Describe God to me. God is something that can't be described. It's so big and all-encompassing. Uh, I have no words. The person that loves me the most. Mm-hmm. Uh. Do you believe in God? Yes. Can you describe him? Uh, no, it's just a feeling I have. It's just it is. annoying. Okay. Yeah. When did you first realize that you had that feeling? Uh, I think, well, my mom taught Sunday school and I used okay. to go to church and okay. I just always had a feeling like, you know, the song Jesus Loves You. It's just a feeling that you had that someone was there taking care of you and then yeah. as you get older, you become something else, you know, as you okay. grow up. Just a sense that there's an overarching entity power in this world, I guess, would be the thing. To be honest, I think something had to create everything in the first place. Mm-hmm. Even like if there's the atoms, something had to put the atoms there. Okay. Um, but now, I don't know if it's just left us to our own devices now, so I wouldn't say there's anyone looking over us or anything. Yeah. Yeah. So do you believe that God exists? And if you do, what is the basis for your belief? Can you articulate it? Over the years, I've met with small groups of men, usually around breakfast, and we would discuss matters of faith. In every group, there were always some who did not believe in God and were skeptical of all religions, including the Christian faith. Following one of the meetings, one of the fellows lingered behind, and he said, you know, I'm just a tad upset. And I said, oh, really? I said, how so? And he said, it just hit me that all through my adolescent years, and in particular in my university days, I was given a lot of reasons not to believe in God. But nowhere along the way was I ever given compelling reasons to believe in God. In fact, the attitude of many of my professors was that anyone who did believe in God, anybody that was a Christian, was a fool, was lacking intelligence. 
Not until this study, he said, did I become aware that there's a truckload of solid evidence and reasons to believe in God and in the Christian faith. Well, that's the reason for this series. As some of you have been exposed to a lot of reasons not to believe in God. My purpose is to introduce you to some compelling reasons to believe in the God of the Bible and the Christian faith. Now, right up front, I want to give thanks and credit to all the theologians, the apologists, the historians, the scientists, the archaeologists and authors who are experts in their field and a lot smarter than I am in these areas just for the invaluable information, the research, the evidence, the insight that I have gleaned from them and used in the preparation for this series. Because I only have time in these sermons to touch on the high points of the evidence, I'm going to be giving you names of those who have been particularly helpful to me in my research, and I will be providing a bibliography with this series. Uh, So if you want to go deeper, just take note of some of the author's names that I refer to, give credit to, and then dig into those references that we provide. My purpose in this series is not to give detailed answers to all of your questions, but to stimulate your thinking and to challenge you to keep searching until you know the truth. For Jesus said, when you truly seek him, you will know the truth. And then he added, the truth will set you free. In this particular message, my goal is to provide a number of reasonable explanations for God's existence. And I say reasonable explanations because it is unreasonable. In fact, it is unrealistic to insist on absolute proof for the existence of God the way that some people and some scientists call for. I can't put God in a test tube and prove him by the usual scientific method for the same reason that I can't prove Julius Caesar by the scientific method. Paul Little says, in order for something to be proved by the scientific method, it must be repeatable. But history, in its very nature, is not repeatable. No one can rerun the beginning of the universe or repeat the assassination of Abraham Lincoln or the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But the fact that these events can't be proved by repetition does not disprove their reality as events. The fact is the scientific method is useful only with measurable things. You see, no one has ever seen three feet of love. No one has ever seen 10 pounds of justice, have you? Don't think so. But we know that they're real. We know that love is real. We know that justice is real. And we'd be foolish to deny their reality. And what I'm saying is is I can't parade God in front of you so that you can touch him physically and see him. If I could, I'd be equal to God or perhaps greater than God. The reality is that almost every dimension of life, we all make decisions based on high probability and seldom with absolute certainty. For example, when you board a plane headed for Edmonton, you do not know with absolute certainty that it will land safely in Edmonton. There's a high probability it will land safely, but absolute certainty? Afraid not. Neither are you absolutely certain that you will get, not get food poisoning from the next meal you eat at a restaurant in Edmonton. <laughs> when you go on a roller coaster at West Edmonton Mall, you cannot be absolutely certain that you'll live through that brain-jolting experience. Isn't that true? 
I mean, it takes a lot of faith to go to Edmonton, right? <laughs> Just a little innocent fun. No, no emails, please. We love you Edmontonians, okay? You see, all of us learn to live with a measure of uncertainty. And we grow accustomed to weighing the evidence and making decisions on high probability factors. Bill Hybels points out that even in a court of law, we don't expect the prosecuting attorneys to prove their cases to the juries beyond a shadow of doubt. No, no prosecuting attorney is called upon to present sufficient evidence. They're called upon to present sufficient evidence to the jury beyond a what? Reasonable doubt. And so it's with that in mind, I want to present several proofs or arguments of the more than 20 that we could focus on for the existence of God that I find most compelling. And I pray that they will serve to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt. We're going to look at just two of them in this message. If you want to dig deeper, those who have been very helpful in my preparation are doctors William Lane Craig, doctors J.P. Moreland, Norman Geisler, Paul Little, and Mark Middleberg. The first argument for the existence of God is the cosmo cosmological argument. This argument is summarized best by the words cause and effect. What caused the world to be? How did everything get here and where did it come from? Well, for years, the atheists responded to that question saying that the universe never had a beginning. It is eternal. It's always existed. And for them, that was the end of the argument. And yet scientists have discovered through their own research that the universe has not gone on forever, but it had a beginning. Dr. Norman Geisler gives several evidences for the universe having a beginning. First of all, the universe is running out of usable energy. This is based on the second law of thermodynamics, which is referred to as the law of entropy. This law holds that all the usable energy in the world is decreasing. For example, if you saw a cup of coffee sitting on a counter somewhere, and you walked up and you touched that cup, and it was still warm, you would know that that cup of coffee has not been sitting there for 50 years, right? In fact, you would know that that cup of coffee has probably not been there for more than 30 minutes. Why is that? Because if left to itself, the coffee cup is going to gradually cool off. It's going to use up all of its heat energy. This is called entropy, useful energy dissipating and being used up. Now, Dr. Moreland says the universe is like that coffee cup. The universe is slowly using up all of its heat energy, its light energy, and its motion. No one disputes the law of entropy. But, but here's the thing. If the universe is slowly using up its motion, its light, and its heat energy, and if the universe hasn't yet used all of its energy up, that means the universe has not been here forever. Because if the universe has always existed, then according to the second law of thermodynamics, it would have used up all of its energy by now. So clearly the universe had a beginning. Furthermore, we believe the universe had a beginning because it's expanding. Dr. Geiser says, think of balloon with dots on it. As you blow up that balloon, the dots grow further apart. In the early 1900s, Albert Einstein introduced his general theory of relativity, which implied, among other things, that the universe had a starting point. Experts tell us 
that through Einstein's equations, we can trace the development of the universe back to its very origin, back to what's called the singularity event. When it actually exploded into existence, or what is often referred to as the Big Bang. In fact, Dutch astronomer William de Sitter, he studied Einstein's equations and derived from them the conclusion that the universe is in fact expanding. Now, Edwin Hubble added on to de Sitter's work by using his 100-inch telescope to verify de Sitter's mathematical prediction. Through the impressive Hubble telescope, astronomers can see that the universe is in fact expanding and that the further away that a galaxy is, the faster it's moving, implying that the universe is expanding from a central point of origin like an inflating balloon or an explosion. Again, the expanding universe points to it having a beginning. Thirdly, Geisler points out that when the universe exploded into being, it left a radiation echo, the wavelength of which is identical to that of a gigantic explosion. Two scientists, Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias, they both got Nobel Peace Prizes for discovering this radiation echo, which also shows that the universe had a beginning. Now, all of this evidence that the universe had a beginning disturbed many scientists, disturbed many atheists, because it implied a beginner. And so many set out to disprove the very conclusions that their scientific investigation had shown to be true. However, physicist and atheist Dr. Stephen Hawking of Cambridge University, he says to this day, all the evidence seems to indicate that the universe has not existed forever, but that it had a beginning. In his book, God and the Astronomers, astrophysicist and agnostic Dr. Robert Jastro. He's the founding director of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies. He says that recent developments in astronomy have proved conclusively that the universe was created. He says a sound explanation may exist for the explosive birth of our universe, but if it does, science cannot find out what that explanation is. The scientist's pursuit of the past ends in the moment of creation. So I trust that you see the implications of all of this. If the universe had a starting point in history, then it must have a cause for its existence. The law of causality states that every event has a cause. This is the basis of all rational thought the basis of all science, and it is really absurd to deny it. So nothing, at least at the macro level, perhaps not at the micro level, but the macro level, nothing cannot cause something. You got that? Nothing cannot cause something. Now Mark Middleberg, he says, if the universe had a cause for its existence, then that cause must be beyond the universe. The universe, by definition, is time, space, matter, and physical energy. So the cause of the universe must be something beyond time and space, matter, and physical energy. In other words, the cause must be something very similar to what we commonly refer to as God. Richard Dawkins one of the greatest proponents for atheism in our times, he actually alluded to this cause when he admitted in an article in Time Magazine a while back, there could be something incredibly grand and incomprehensible 
and beyond our present understanding. When he was challenged by someone with, well, sir, that's God, he replied, well, yes, but it could be any one of billions of gods. The chance of it being a particular God, Yahweh, the God of Jesus, is vanishingly small, he says. Again, Middleburg responds to Dawkins, saying, you can call him what you want, but the evidence from the origin of the universe tells us a lot about what he is like. And the description sounds amazingly similar to what the Bible tells us about one particular God who actually is called Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the creator of the world. This is what Christians have always believed. Agnostic Robert Jastrow in his book, God and the Astronomers, he sums up his conclusion with these stunning words. Now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The details differ, but the essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. The chain of events leading to man commenced suddenly and sharply at a definite moment in time in a flash of light and energy. Scientists cannot bear the thought of a natural phenomena which cannot be explained, even with unlimited time and money. There is a kind of religion in science. Every event can be explained in a rational way as the product of some previous event. Every effect must have a cause. Now science has proven that the universe exploded into being at a certain moment. It asks, what cause produced this effect? Who or what put matter and energy into the universe? And science cannot answer these questions. And then he goes on, with this conclusion. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountain of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries reading Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those are stunning words from a man who doesn't believe in a personal God. Now, some immediately argue, but who created God? God, by definition, is eternal and uncreated. If God was a created being, he would not and could not be God. Dr. R.C. Sproul says, not everything must have a cause. The law of cause and effect states simply for every effect, there is a cause. However, God does not have a cause because he's eternal and he's self-existent. Being eternal, he is not an effect the way that the universe is. And therefore, he does not require a cause. He is uncaused. You see, when God created the universe, he created matter and time and space. And all of these properties of the universe are subject to the principles of cause and effect. However, outside of our universe, there is no space, no matter, or time, and our eternal God exists in that dimension which is not subject to the principle of cause and effect. The Bible indicates in passages like Titus 1-2 that God created time, that he exists independent of time. He isn't limited to our definition of time, which means he's eternal. He has no beginning or end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And that is why the Bible does not attempt to explain where God came from. It just assumes his existence. 
It just says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so that is a very brief overview of the cosmological argument for the existence of God. We want to look at just one more, and that is the teleological argument. This argument is summarized best with the words order and design. Not only is the universe here, as we've just talked about, but if you examine it closely, it runs like a precision watch. The teleological argument asks who is responsible for the intricacies, the symmetry, the fine-tuning, the purposefulness, and the coordination of all that we see around us. King David, he said in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Now, what that means is, is that if you take your telescope and you carefully study the cycle of the stars and the planets, you would be compelled to conclude that this universe is the product of intricate, intelligent design. For example, how many of you have had the privilege of personally uh, seeing the Grand Canyon? How many of you? How oh, about 10, 15% of you? So you've been there. Now the question is, does it take intelligence to produce the Grand Canyon? Well, Dr. Geisler says, not really. Now, he goes on to say, you know, I do believe that the finger of God was involved in its formation, but scientifically, you can explain all of that by natural law. Sedimentation, building up over a long period of time, a river eroding through it, yada, yada, yada. However, if you were to go out to Kananaskis this afternoon and see the image of four Center Street pastors' faces clearly etched on the side of Mount Kidd, <laughs> you would say, man, it must have taken an intelligent being to create something like that. A very bored intelligent being, I might add, <laughs> but a very intelligent being nonetheless. Why? Because, as Dr. Geister explains, erosion produces things like you see in the Grand Canyon. But no natural laws of erosion have ever produced the faces of four presidents of the United States on Mount Rushmore. Anytime we see a complex design, we know from our experience that it came from the mind of a designer. I mean, if you see a watch, you know that there is a watchmaker who made it. If you see a beautiful painting, you know that there is an artist who painted that portrait. If you see a building, you know that there's an architect that designed that building. In short, where you have a design, you know you have a designer. For example, consider how God's intricate order and design is evident in the universe. As scientists have been studying the parameters of our physical world, particularly over the last 30 to 40 years, these, uh, th these parameters of our physical world that makes life possible, they have discovered that everything in the universe seems to be precisely fine-tuned to make life possible. And doctors Ken Boa and Robert Bowman, they point out that there are four fundamental forces that are constant throughout the universe. One is the strong nuclear force. Two is the weak nuclear force. Three is the electromagnetic force. And the fourth is the gravitational force. If any of those forces were even just a little stronger or a little weaker, and when I say that, I'm referring to if they were a little weaker by a billionth or millionth percentage point, 
there would be no life on earth. If the force of gravity, for example, were to be slightly greater or weaker by one part in 10,000 billion, 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 big number. If that was the case, conscious life would be virtually impossible anywhere in the universe. Or take the electromagnetic force as an example. This force binds electrons to the nuclei of atoms. If this force was slightly stronger, atoms could not share electrons and there would be no formation of molecules and therefore no life. If the electromagnetic force were slightly weaker, the electrons would fly away and so would any chance for molecules and life. You know, that reminds me, by the way, of what Colossians says about our Lord Jesus. He is the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Scientists have also shown that if the galaxies in the universe were expanding away from one another a little bit slower or a little bit faster. Again, there could be no living things anywhere in the universe. Now let's bring it right down into our own solar system. Our sun has the right mass, the right light, the right distance, the right orbit, the right galaxy, the right location, and the right age to nurture and sustain life on earth. Our sun is a middle-aged star. If it was a little younger, it would be much hotter, and we would all be charred toast. If it was a little older, it would be much colder, and the earth would be a block of ice, even colder than it is right now. The earth rotates at a speed of over a thousand miles per hour. If it were to spin a little bit slower, life would be destroyed by the searing heat during the day and the devastating freezes at night. If it were to rotate a little faster, catastrophic winds would occur. If the earth's speed traveling around the sun were a little slower or a little faster. If our moon was a little larger or a little smaller or a little further away or closer to the earth. If Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, was a little larger or smaller or a little further or closer to the earth, there would be no life on our planet. Now, Richard Dawkins, in his book, The God Delusion, he attempts to explain this away by saying, but there are trillions of universes. Given the enormous amount of universes existing over enormous amounts of time and space, it is inevitable, he says, that some of them are fine-tuned to sustain our kind of life. Well, he's right in the sense that the possibility does exist, as minuscule as it may be. But let's consider for a moment what the odds are of a finely tuned universe like ours that is able to sustain life being generated by chance, as Dawkins wants us to believe. To help us to give, uh, to, to, to give us a feel for the odds, Dr. William Craig, he points out that the number of seconds in the history of the universe um, is about 10 to the 18th power. That is 10 followed by 18 zeros. Pretty big number. The number of subatomic particles or atoms in the entire universe has been calculated to be 10 to the 80th power. Even bigger number. Now, with those numbers in mind, consider this. Donald Page, one of America's eminent cosmologists, has calculated the odds 
of our life-sustaining, finely-tuned universe existing by chance to be one chance out of 10 to the 123rd power. A number, says William Craig, that is so inconceivable that to call it astronomical would be a wild understatement. In fact, scientists consider anything beyond 1 in 10 to the 50th power to be impossible. This is almost three times greater. J.P. Moreland says that Anthony Flew, who is one of the leading intellectual defenders of atheists over the last 50 years, he became a believer in God because of this overwhelming evidence. Because of all of this evidence, Paul Davies, one of the leading physicists and cosmologists of our day, he makes this remarkable statement. I cannot believe that our existence in this universe is a mere quirk of fate. We are truly meant to be here. That is quite a statement, again, coming from someone who defines himself as an agnostic. Agnostic Robert Jastrow who has called, this the, has called this the most powerful evidence for the existence of God ever to come out of science. It's amazing, but science has truly become and is a friend of the Christian faith, of the scriptures, not an enemy. But more importantly than that, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's just take it from the macro level to the micro level for a moment and consider the example, an example from genetics, the DNA that makes up who you and I are. Do you realize that DNA has a message in it? Again, Norman Geisler points out that DNA has a four-letter alphabet, and that four-letter alphabet spells out the code of life and tells each cell in your body exactly how to develop. DNA determines the height, the hair color, the skeletal arrangement of 206 bones, 600 muscles, 10,000 auditory nerve fibers, 2 million optic nerve fibers, 1 billion nerve cells, and 400 billion feet of blood vessels and capillaries. That's a lot of DNA. All this genetic material is coded information. Now, how much information do you think is in a DNA of just a one-cell animal? Enough to fill Webster's unabridged dictionary. And, there, and that is a conservative estimate. If all the DNA of the one trillion cells in your body and my body, the one trillion cells in a body, if it were stretched out, it would stretch from the earth to the moon more than 500,000 times. You know, Carl Sagan, <clears throat> the great agnostic astronomer, once said, if we can get a single message from outer space, it'll prove that there are intelligent beings out there and it'll save the world. I'm not sure what he meant about saving the world. And you know, they have telescopes in various places. And they are still waiting for a single message from outer space. Well, folks, I want you to just think about this. If a single sentence, according to Carl Sagan, from outer space means that there is intelligence out there somewhere, what about the staggering number of messages that's found in the DNA right in your body and my body? Geiser says, for you to deny that there's a creator, that there's a designer of our universe, the designer of man, and it's in essence, for you to be an atheist, you have to believe that Webster's Dictionary resulted from an explosion in a printing factory. All the ink and the paper were there. Someone dropped a bomb and splat. 
the dictionary sprang into existence. The fact is, he says, it'll never happen. You can drop bombs from now till doomsday, and you'll never produce anything but a mess. You see, natural laws randomize. Only intelligent beings give messages. As far as I'm concerned, to believe that such an elaborate, coded, complex program was the result of an accident, I'm sorry, that requires a whole lot more faith than to believe that our God created it. Now, next week, we're going to continue with some additional arguments for the existence of God. But I want to close by just reading a passage from Isaiah 40, in which God says this to us. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, asks the Holy One. Look up to the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each other by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. My question of you in closing is, you know, as you honestly examine the motivations and the state of your own heart, would you say that you're truly looking for reasons to believe? Or are you just looking for reasons not to believe? Are you suppressing the truth? Trying to explain the truth away about God and his existence because you just want to keep being the center of your own universe And you want to just keep living the way that you are. Over the years, you know, I've had numerous people confess to me that they knew God existed. They just knew it intuitively. But they purposefully avoided God. They latched on to anything that would support their skepticism of God because they didn't want God messing with their lives, messing with their values, messing with their freedom. If you would have to admit that this is where you are at, then nothing I or anyone else can say will ever change your mind. No reasons will ever convince you. No evidence ever will either. On the other hand, if you are truly open to finding reasons to believe, then here is what I want to challenge you to do in in the weeks to come. Daily ask God, however you perceive him to be, to reveal himself to you because the Bible tells us that God is pursuing us. He's trying to get our attention. He's revealing himself all over the place if we would but realize it. We're going to wrap up with a song that speaks about the wonder of our great and majestic God. If you're a Christ follower, the question that I would like you to ask as you just take in this song, is to what extent am I truly surrendered and living for this God that I say I believe in? Because if he is real, and folks, I believe to the core of my being that he is, that has implications for our lives. If you are seeking God, I encourage you to reach out to him in faith and ask him to reveal himself to you that you might see him as he is. Commit yourself to sincerely studying, seeking the answers to the questions that are keeping you from trusting him with your life. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. If you have a prayer need, there are prayer partners that would love to pray with you before you go. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter 